market would basically <coughs> break down. If, if the mini budget, um, if the discussions that would have happened under normal, uh, in normal times, as you described, where there'd be some preemptive conversations between the Treasury and the bank, would you have been in a position to forewarn them of what might happen if they introduced a £45 billion pound unfunded uh, set of tax cuts and so, and so on? Um, would, would there be signals that no, could no, be sent I, I, to them? Um, or did you not see it coming? As I, so as I said earlier, you can't predict entirely what a market sure. reaction would be. You could I predict think the some thing of the one, risks, right? You could think, warn them of some of the risks. I think the thing one would have said, but it was being said. I mean, if, if you yeah. look at the um, uh, the IFS, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. that um, if it's unfunded, yeah. and that we didn't know to what extent it would be funded or unfunded, and there was a growth plan, yeah. which I think would have been intended to fund it through higher growth. But if the markets uh, lose confidence in the fiscal credibility, then they will just increase the cost of borrowing. And one would have made that point. Um, and uh, um, uh, that if you, for ministers decide to do that, but the market reaction would need to take into account whether we would have been able to anticipate just how fast yep. that would have been. I think it's also a market reaction to a new government that it didn't know. Um, and I think the, the then chancellor said on the Sunday on television there would be further tax oh, cuts, yeah. which I think did have an impact in Asian markets and the, on the Sunday evening very clearly and, and the like. Um, would we have been able to predict it would go so far and fast as to stress this particular point? Probably not. You could have, you uh, but could we have would have known there would yeah. be a rising curve against the background of an international picture where, where interest rates have been uh, tightening, financial has been tightening for nearly a year. I think, yes, we would have had that. Yeah. But I don't know if you... if. I mean, Andrew, if you wanted to say something... Well, like look, that. I mean, I think consistent with what John is, is saying... This was a situation that went from, we're ringing you to let you know, yep. to shouting <laughs> on the phone yeah. to us yeah. within two days. Yep. So the Friday was a, um, uh, a conversation, as John has said, of, um, it's been a bit tricky today. Uh, we know these people well. We've been speaking to them for years. We have a well-established market intelligence function. Um, we're letting you know, probably OK. By Monday... The tone was getting more worried, and by Monday evening, I was just in back-to-back -back calls with LDI firms who essentially were going to be up that night listing the guilt sales that they would be executing the following morning. And actually, this is not the kind of task that they're used to doing. They're used to selling a few yeah. guilts in rather orderly ways. This was a full-scale liquidation event. And, and I think if I just put a bit of colour on what's being said, yeah. that non-linearity from this is more or less manageable to this is completely out of control was something that happened over the weekend and into the Monday and Tuesday. OK. And so you mentioned, Sir John, that it got worse when the Chancellor, then Chancellor, made this remark about further tax cuts. So, so, so actually, rather than calming nerves, <laughs> it went the other way. Um, do you, is there a case for now um, adding among the stress tests to financial stability, government stupidity? Uh, um, or certainly alienating or isolating, uh, I, I, isolating I, I, credible institutions yeah. so that they can actually make the um, assessments? In a way, the stress tests we do are basically um, blind to the underlying cause. So we don't say, you know, there could be a pandemic. We never, we never, or there could be a war, or there could be um, uh, some government action that would trigger this. We simply say, if for whatever reason, guilt yields move by a hundred basis points, could you live with it? If for whatever reason the economy on the banking stress test. Uh, went into a certain level of recession, if market, if the exchange rate moved in a certain way, if we saw um, normal banking stress test is a 35% drop in house prices, are you resilient to it? And the reason, and it's true, those are more generic, and the contours of every stress event are different. So COVID was very different in the way it impacted to, to uh, the financial crisis, and this event was very different. To, to the COVID shock. With respect, but what we're seeing is that the bank is, is having to react to a set of decisions that have been made without even being party to 
uh, the normal practice of being being party to what the government <laughs> might do, may or may not do, which is important, having a line of yeah. sight. You didn't have a line of sight. You were flying blind and reacting to a set of grave mistakes that were made. There must be some lessons that can be learned from this. And by the way, the governor, when he was here in the last session, we were having a, a discussion about interest rates and the fact that not only are you having to, because of the necessary conditions with inflation, having to raise interest rates, but with the government's funding um, uh, tax cuts, uh, it, this is likely to be much more serious. Yeah. Those, those warnings were there, and what's frustrating is that actually uh, this is not, you know, we're grateful that we have an independent bank, and, and long may that continue, uh, that actually you're having to pick up the pieces, which is you've had to do very dramatically here, and there, is, there has to be some lessons learnt about what we do to put a break on uh, irresponsible action by government ministers, who, whichever colour that they may be, and, uh, right now it's Conservative government, uh, I don't, you know, frankly, uh, the public public don't care who, so long as we have financial stability, and we need to learn from that. What are the lessons from what's just happened? Well, I'd, um, maybe I'd say, say, say two things. First of all, I think the institutional framework is what sets the constraints on what can be done and what can't be done. That's set by Parliament, yep. uh, not, by, uh, not by us. The OBR was set up um, after my time in the Treasury, but it was set up uh, to ensure that there was an independent view of the fiscal numbers because of um, uh, credibility and, if you like, constraint. The Bank of England was given responsibility mm. for uh, monetary policy, uh, you know, for a similar reason after the inflation episodes uh, of the uh, uh, of the 90s and 80s. Mm. So I think it's for Parliament to decide what constraints to to put in that sense. On stress tests, though, a lesson we have taken, and Sarah may want to comment on this is that um, there can be events that move things beyond historical experience. So everything is based on what's happened in the past. Yep. We saw in COVID that, that actually you see movements you've never seen before. This is an example of a different cause, um, but on a stressed financial system going through a change in an interest rate regime, uh, certain actions led to a very fast mm -hmm. market reaction, which pushed this up. And I mean, if I can, Generalised, I think when one does resilience testing, whether it's in the insurance industry on solvency uh, or whether it's uh, on banks, um, one needs to think, OK, well, you know, the history says 100 basis points is out of our historical experience, but if this is very important, do we need to build in some resilience above that? Because you know, we've had uh, a number of out-of-historical experience events over the last few years, and, and this was one of them, but I don't know. I very much agree with that. Uh, what we had done in 2018 was working with the pensions regulator. We had done a scenario analysis, a stress test of these funds. Uh, the scenarios we'd used were 25, 50, and 100 basis points increases instantaneously mm. in long-term interest rates. They looked very conservative in the context of the actual historical behaviour of that part of the curve. What we saw on this occasion was something that was sharper and of greater scale and of great, at greater speed than uh, that. And that yeah, is the lesson. <laughs> the speed point is well made and well understood. But what we could see with, as you say, over the summer, all these, all these proposals for tax cuts we could see that the bank was going going in the opposite direction to where government was. <coughs> Your, the former governor of the Bank of England described it as cro working at cross purposes. We talked about being, I, I raised the point about the, the positions being out of sync. Um, in fact, it's, it's much worse. Is there, are there lessons to be learnt around what else you could have done to mitigate the risks in relation, in particular, what the FPC could do to financial stability, but also lessons to learn around policy coordination, if you like, because it's very difficult for you uh, to have to pick up the pieces afterwards, which is, in a sense, what, you, what you've had to do. Um, maybe a number of points. First, I think what this episode shows is that you know, policy decisions that might have one effect you know, in one environment can have a very different effect in, a, in another environment. And the current environment is one, as I say, where um, financial conditions are tightening globally. There's very high inflation. You know, in another world, maybe the market reaction would have been different. Those things need to be factored in. Uh, but, um, you know... Uh, we, we were all alive to the sensitivities. Yeah, but, but, but maybe just, just on, the, 
on the broader point of the coordination. Yeah. So um, I think it's important that monetary policy understands what fiscal policy is doing mm. and how it's doing. But one of the reasons why I'm, I'm slightly nervous about coordination, and I worked in the Treasury when we set interest rates and set fiscal policy, so mm. I've been there, if I could put it that way, mm. um, is that actually um, you want the fiscal authority to decide, and different objectives for fiscal policy, it affects redistribution, um, uh, it affects the economy uh, in a different way. You want the fiscal authority to decide what it wants oh. to do, and the monetary policy to have the, to, uh, to have the tools to react in order to meet the inflation objective. So information is good, uh, in yeah. my view. Uh, coordination is a funny word which stretches from cooperation on the one hand to constraint on the other, if I can put it that way. So um, I think two authorities that communicate, yeah. fine. Two authorities that try to work out we'll do this much with fiscal and this much with monetary, I think risks uh, blurring the objectives of the two policies. And actually, we have experience of that. Uh, the look at the, um, uh, the experience of monetary policy uh, over the 80s and 90s, I think, in the UK is a good experience of that. So I before you were independent? Pardon? Before yeah. the bank was yeah. independent? Be before we separated, or I would, I would put it, before we separated fiscal policy uh, and monetary policy.